Good morning, good morning, my brothers and my sisters. Welcome to the Church Town Church of God. The Christmas lights are on. The little Santa trombonist is on the piano because we have a trombonist. Let me show you something else here. Maybe you haven't seen it. This is the great Advent tradition here at Churchtown. And look, there are leftovers, oranges and chocolate, oranges and chocolate at Churchtown. There is the biker Santa. We like to try to have a little bit of fun here. And here's a little something else. Not to spoil the ending, but everything will be all right. That's kind of what we talked about on Sunday, everything being all right. I'll show you the Christmas lights once again. Twinkling with the tree turning. You see the tree turning? Very, very beautiful. Very, very beautiful. Thank you, Lord. We are looking forward to Saturday evening. Saturday evening, Christmas Eve at seven o'clock. Don't know what you might be doing, but I'll be in church. Have been for a long time. Even before I truly became a Christian, I was a Christer. I went to church during Christmas and Easter. <laughs> So even before I was a Christian, I was a Christer. Before I was a Christian, I was more of a deist. I believed in God. I prayed to God. I didn't understand salvation through Jesus Christ. But I was more of a deist, which is an individual who believes in a God or God or that there is a intelligent designer, that sort of thing. And then I had an encounter with the living Christ. The rest is history, as they say. I'm glad you're here with us this morning. Lord, we pray that what we do this morning honors you. We pray a prayer of thanksgiving for all that you are all that we have through you in Jesus' name. Let your wisdom, Lord, come shining through. Amen. Amen, Rick. Good stuff. Just wanted to check in with you. Like I said, I don't know about Friday. We'll see. Weather's Thursday and Friday's a little shaky around here, but it shouldn't be that bad. Good morning, Josh. It shouldn't be that bad. I got to smoke a pork shoulder for Friday night, so I'm thinking about smoking it tomorrow. Thursday, bad weather. Wait, yeah, Thursday, bad weather. Friday, 40 mile per hour winds. So I'm thinking about something. I'm going to smoke it tomorrow. I pulled the pork shoulder this morning already. Just so you know. <coughs> so here we are at Christmas time. A time of year that I said something really dumb on Sunday. Shocking, I know. I said about gathering your friends and your family and bringing them to church. What I, it wasn't done because I intended to say, I did say, it's such a unique encounter. It's such a unique service, Christmas Eve, that it actually is a very good time. I said, you may not think Christmas Eve is a good time to bring someone who may not be a Christian, like me, a priester, to church, but you know, it is. The Christmas Eve service is, is more of an encounter than anything else. It is, it's just beautiful. Good morning, April. You don't come up in my tags anymore. Got your, the card from Isaiah 61. Thank you. <coughs> so Christmas Eve is a wonderful time to bring friends, family, agnostics, deists, atheists, whatever the case may be, say, hey, we're going to church. It kind of always gets me a little bit when a faithful church member says, well, we have family in town, so we won't be in church on Sunday because they don't go to church. Okay. 
So that's the way it works. If you hang out with somebody who does not go to church, you just don't go. It doesn't work the other way around. Or you can't set a good example and say, we'll be back in a couple of hours. It's Sunday morning, we're going to church. It's who we are. But most often, I won't go to church because my family's in town. We love supporting truly is an amazing body of Christ that truly seeks to affect South Central Pennsylvania. It's amazing stuff around here. It's amazing stuff going on in so many local churches. That's what it's all about. That's what the Church of God is all about, really the local church. The small embedded local church. That's the backbone. And we can try all we want to do different initiatives and different things and look different ways, but it, that's our DNA, man. It's the small local embedded church serving the communities in which they are embedded. We have a saying around here, what can we do? We look around and we're a tiny little church in a tiny little town and we look around the world going to hell in a hand basket on a roller coaster and we can be so overwhelmed that we know and the enemy is saying, you can't do anything. So we just flip that on its ear and say, what can we do? We can change the world one conversation at a time. We can support local people who are doing good in an evil world. We can do good in an evil world by the power of Christ within us. What can you do? So there we are. So we were talking about you know, Christmas Eve. And I remember being moved at Christmas Eve services. Even before I was a real Christian, a Christian I should say. We have ours at seven o'clock, much like many people. You know what I don't like? Here's another pet peeve. Foot one, this is just me rambling. I got some First Peter scripture here. But the first pet peeve was when faithful churchgoers say, I won't be in church on Sunday because I have family in town. Okay. I mean, I want them to hear me. We don't talk about things like that, do we? Yes, we do. We should. We should hold each other accountable. The body of Christ should hold one another accountable. If you don't see a friend, a brother or sister in Christ in church, check in on them. What's up? Well, I had family in town, so we didn't come to church. Why? Hold them accountable. You can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't be a nasty jerk. But ask the questions that make people think. Hold people accountable. I want to be held accountable. I seek that. Good morning, Mama D. And another thing that kind of bothers me, and I understand that church services take offerings. Most church services take offerings. <coughs> <coughs> Believe it or not, I went to the doctor yesterday, got a clean bill of health. Tis the season. But taking an offering on Christmas Eve I mean, we don't take offerings around here anyway. And, we, and, I, and even when we did, I ne would never think of taking one on Thanksgiving Eve or Maundy Thursday or Christmas Eve. Mm. A little cringy there in the middle of an encounter, in the middle of a cantata, in the middle of the worship of Christ on Christmas Eve, celebrating the God incarnate to say, no, let's just take a moment. Pass the plate. Maybe it's just me. But then you know that you have churches around, especially large churches, they're like, Christmas Eve is a money maker, baby. We're gonna have four different services. We're gonna fill this place up. We're gonna make four times the amount of money that we normally do. That's very distasteful. And if that's your thinking, that's not right. So, inherently wrong or right, I'm not gonna make a judgment on that if your heart is in the right place. It's inherently wrong if you're just like, yeah, licking your chops for Christmas Eve because you get more extra services. 
And you can take extra offerings. Anyway, those are just my thoughts. Ask the questions that make people think. I like to be challenged and I like to think. Get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Beautiful writing. Beautiful writing. That's a New Living Translation. And they do a really good job in certain spots. That's one of the spots they do a really good job. It was a happy, happy coincidence. If you listen to Ask N.T. Write Anything, it drops, I think, the podcast on Thursday or Thursday. I listened to it on Friday. And he referenced 1 Peter chapter 1, which was part of our scriptures last Sunday. And how salvation is kept pure Heaven is kept pure in the spiritual realm as we await the return of Christ. And I thought that was really neat. Because that first Peter chapter one scripture about this inheritance is waiting for you, this salvation is waiting for you. It's being kept for you, undefiled, and we will, we will know it when all is revealed through Christ and his return. It's not that we sort of die and wait around. It's that the reality of the new heaven and the new earth is being kept pure and undefiled to be revealed in the last days. And those who persevere to the end will be saved. We will participate in heaven, which is God dwelling in his temple on earth. I said on Sunday, you know, often we talk about, good morning, Liz, I hope you're feeling better, love. I really do. You're being covered. You and your whole family are being covered in prayer. Know that much. Just know that much. This season has been so challenging for so many folks. Physically, spiritually, emotionally. It just seems like an extra challenging season. And I don't think it's coincidence. I think things are getting ramped up. And so if you're a Bible-believing, faithful church or Bible-believing, faithful human being moving forward in this world, you're, it, it's getting ramped up. Here we are in Christmas time, and if you're faithful to Christmas and celebrating the incarnation of Christ, it's being ramped up. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, God's image bearers are being, we always say attacked, but at the very least burdened. You're welcome, Liz. Good morning, Andy. <coughs> oh, we said anyway that oftentimes we refer to the story of Scripture as from Eden to Eden, right? From, and what we mean is conceptually, actually, because if you look at Scripture, we go from a garden to a city, not from a garden to a garden. But conceptual, conceptually, we go from communing with God without an intermediary, Jesus Christ, to communing with God without an intermediary, Jesus Christ. That's what we're talking about when we talk about going from Eden to Eden. We're talking about going to, from the state of being able to be in the presence of a holy God through the story of humankind to the state of being able to be in the presence of a holy God. Now, theologically, it's fascinating, and we could talk forever about how it begins in a garden and ends in a city. And then we look around at our cities today, and we're like, what? I don't want to be in a city. So I think that's fascinating, and I think that the Lord is doing what he's doing with the cities for a reason. So I thought that was neat that N.T. Wright referenced that, g gave a little exposition on that. I, I gave him full credit when I used his example about uh, being with a 
your friend. This friend is staying with you, right? Staying with you at your house, and they have a key to your house. They're, they're, you know, and you're out and about, and you tell them if you get home before I do, there's beer in the fridge. Well, does that mean that that individual needs to go into the house and then sit in the fridge and then drink the beer or eat the food? No, it means that it's being preserved there for them in the best state. All they need to do is enter the house, and there it is. It will be there. Open the door. So that's where we look at heaven. When we talk about heaven, I just read another thing this morning. My, my preacher preached that heaven, it, that when you die, you do not go to heaven. And that's the last I ever listened to that preacher. Well, the preacher was telling the truth. Heaven is made real through the second coming of Christ. Now, before you all scream, what? Heresy? We know from scripture that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We know that on a couple of different occasions, we know that spiritually we are with Jesus Christ. but we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the house of the Lord, his creation. Earth, the temple, and all will be made right. All will be renewed. We will be made right. We will be glorified and fully renewed and restored and dwell here forever with him. That's heaven. Remember, God's unique creations. You have spiritual beings that are not embodied, that can appear to be embodied. You have physical beings that are not spiritual. Cows, badgers, I don't know why these, guinea pigs. And you have the unique creation of human beings that are both physical and spiritual. When we die, our spiritual selves are with Jesus Christ. And our physical selves will be restored and renewed and glorified in the age to come. Understand that. Because you know why? Understanding Scripture, going beyond a second grade education, going beyond Bible stories... Going beyond the imagery of we die and we sprout wings and become angels with halos and all those different things is important. It's important for you in this day and age to know what you believe and why you believe it. It's important for you as a Christian. Good morning, Miss Mary. Check in with me then. Let me know how you're doing. It's important to, as Christians, as an individual, when we say go out and have that conversation to know about the one you are conversing, what you're telling about them. It's important for the church to grow roots not five miles wide and two inches deep, but two inches wide and five miles deep. Why? Because those who remain faithful to the end will be saved. And we know through trials and tribulations, it speaks of in 1 Peter chapter 1, <clears throat> though you will go through many trials, it will only serve to strengthen your faith, to purify your faith as gold is purified by fire. And if you do not have any understanding of the scriptures and the reality of salvation, the reality of who you are, how you were made, the reality of being an image bearer of God, and as you are saved, being a son or a daughter of the Most High God, then those trials and tribulations or those questions that fly into us from all the anti-Christian everything that's out there, you're like, oh, maybe you're right. I don't know. I don't know. I can't answer that. So it's important. It's important that churches go deep. It's important that churches preach 
salvation and the good news of Jesus Christ every single time they get together, for that is the rock upon which the church is built, our faith in the living God. Go to church, it's important, but your church, being a church, is important. Being a good old Christian church. We sang hymns, you know, Christmas carols on Sunday, and, and, and uh, I called it Long Song Sunday because we were saying the first Noel, and oh, we were saying long songs. And uh, then I just wanted to point out the really, really good theology. Why do we sing hymns in church? And there are modern hymns and a few more modern songs, shall we say, that are also good. But if you're going to worship God, that song should be telling the story of salvation. That song should be speaking of the gospel. That song should be speaking of good theology, a good theological reflection of scripture, not just your ecstatic feelings. So much of it is our ecstatic feelings. So much of church gets wrapped up in our ecstatic feelings. We end up bouncing around and doing all kinds of things. And But I digress. Get rid of your evil behavior. Cry out for the nourishment of pure spiritual milk. Now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness, you are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. What we just talked about. The temple throughout scripture is God's dwelling place. The Hebrews built physical temples and within that temple was the Holy of Holies and that was God's dwelling place. The years in the desert, the pillar of fire, the tabernacle, the pillar of fire and the column of or column of fire. Yeah, pillar of fire, column of smoke. Let me get it right. God's dwelling place. The Garden of Eden, God's dwelling place. And we carry that through, through salvation and the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. The temple, God's dwelling place. We gather together in church and we are bound together by as brother and sister through the power of God's Holy Spirit, God's dwelling place. And the age to come, when all of creation, God's creation, is made new again, glorified to the point where we, those who remain faithful to the end, will dwell in the house, the temple of the Lord forever. God's dwelling place. And the cornerstone of it all is Jesus Christ. And Peter's going to go on to describe how we, as little examples, right, as, as um, living Temples are set upon that rock and together we form the church. So <clears throat> you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. 
That's not very encouraging. You mean somebody that I love very much and think very highly of may stumble and fall and, and, and end up in hell? Yes. There's never a place in Scripture where the full gospel is not taught or preached. Understanding the depth and the breadth of salvation is very important. Your intentionality, you hear the word of God, you hear the truth, you hear somebody speak it, you are with somebody who's living it and speaking it, all of those things, you hear and you reject. Jesus Christ is the crux of human life. And when you know of him, you will accept or reject. That's the reality. When you know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made as a human being, spiritual and physical, when you know that this consciousness is not some derivation of some evolution from a monkey, when you know all of those things, that God seeks to redeem his special creation, all of creation, but the special creation, and you reject that, there you go. And scripture is very clear. Jesus Christ preaches it. The apostles preach it. The full gospel, the understanding that you are a unique and special category of creation that God is the creator, that your nature is fallen in sin and self-righteousness, but God redeems. God seeks to redeem. God has provided the path of redemption to you accept or reject. It's a hard reality, and it harkens back to what I said earlier. My family's in town, they don't go to church, so I won't be there Sunday. How much must you hate your family not to tell them about Jesus Christ? And there is no guarantee, but you, 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 you see that. How much, must, we're supposed to love our neighbor, but I don't wanna say anything offensive. You're not saying anything. You're speaking the truth. Their decision is not based upon your truth telling. Their intentionality is theirs, but they know. Or they have, and they have witnessed. Nothing stops mom and dad from going to church. Nothing stops Aunt Margaret and Uncle Bob from going to church on Sunday morning. We know it's gonna happen. They live as Christians. Maybe that would just be the influencing factor that is needed for the ones that you hold so dear. Hmm. Good morning, Edie. They stumble because they do not obey God's word. Hmm. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Hello, Great Commission. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light, once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as, a tempor as temporary residents and foreigners, right? We live, what does scripture say? People are like the grass in the field. We live but a moment and are swept away to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. 
then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Be a Christian. If you're a Christian, don't be afraid to act like it. There you go. I hope that that's encouraging to you this morning. Because sometimes, as I discuss with a lot of people, especially this season, and with me as well, you just put your both feet on the floor, you adjust your crown as a son or a daughter of the Most High God, you get your rear end up and you put one foot in front of the other and there's no other way to do it. You are filled with God's Holy Spirit, the very power that raised Christ from the dead. You can do it because he can do it. And so you go and you live. You are a living temple of God. That's it. I hope you all have amazing weeks. I don't know if I'll be back with you on Friday. Maybe, maybe not. We talked about singing some Christmas carols, but nobody ever, nobody sent me any word that they want to sing Christmas carols. But I'm looking forward to Saturday night. Wonderful, wonderful time together. Father, we do pray that your word will fill hearts this day. We praise you for the ability to reach so many people in this day and age. Lord, we pray that your word will purify the souls of those who will believe, turning hearts and minds toward you, saving souls, bringing them into the kingdom of God, empowering them to know who they really are. Lord, show us your will. In Jesus' name, amen. There we go. There we go. That's it. I get there's no, I'm not transitioning out of this very well, but we will. I got a bunch of errands to run this morning. I'm going to smoke a pork shoulder tomorrow, and we're going to get ready for an incredible weekend. I hope you are also. But be a living cornerstone. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't go to church because. You know, my son's home. Hello? I love you. Peace. See you in church. I should probably be quiet before I make everybody mad. <laughs>